Welcome back, welcome back, welcome back. I'm Lisa Blackburn. This is my YouTube channel where we talk about everything I want to, science and math. And today we are in chemistry class finishing up reactions, hopefully finishing up. So this is unit five. And um, so anyway, uh, so we had gotten to the point where we had learned how to balance the reactions and y'all are gonna get to practice that tonight. And now we're gonna talk about more symbolism in reactions. And so um, the, here is our reaction that I did, which is where we struck a match. And so this is it written out, how you write reactions. And it starts, it says there's three phosphoruses, and then it's got a little S in parentheses. When do you have these lowercase little things in parentheses, they're indicating the state of matter. So remember how I told you with my peanut butter cookie recipe that, um, uh, that instead, in a normal recipe, list the ingredients, and then it's got a little paragraph underneath that tells you the temperature, how long to cook it, how to mix it, all that stuff. Chemical reactions tell you all of that in one line. It doesn't, you don't have to have a little, um, a paragraph underneath to tell you how to make it. I know how to do this just by looking at that. And it, this tells me the amounts. It tells me everything I need to know to make that. So how they do that is through these symbols. So what do you think S in parentheses stands for? Solid. What do you think L in parentheses stands for? Liquid. What do you think G in parentheses stands for? Gas. Y'all are brilliant. What do you think AQ stands for in parentheses? It's a little trickier. Think of, Silver. What? Silver. No. Uh, think of your Spanish lingo. What can it be if you think Spanish a little bit? What? Water. water. Right. It's aqueous, which means it's in water. Aqueous. In water. A uh, big C with a little circle up top. What do you think that stands for? Celsius. Celsius degrees. And it could be, it's usually Celsius degrees. Uh, put that right here so I remember to mark you here in the computer. Um, oh, you signed in, so I don't have to. That means you, you put yourself in the computer. There you go. Um, anyway, so it could, it could be Celsius degrees. It could be Kelvin. But, and what it would have is it'd have a number with it to tell you what temperature it needs to be at. Just like how the cookies need to be cooked at 375 Fahrenheit. And where this is, is they will write it on the arrow. They'll write it real little, either above or below the arrow. So this means it's at a certain temperature. I'm just going to put temp. Certain temperature. Okay, what do you think CR stands for? It's sort of symbol, similar to the AQ, but it's not Spanish. Any guess for CR? It's crystal. You need it in a crystalline form. Crystalline form. Okay, an arrow down, and that would be like, it would be um, after one of the reactions, one of the reactants, um, I mean, usually one of the products, there'd be a little arrow going down. Any idea what that one could be for? It means that it's going to have a solid precipitate. So this was my reaction that I did for y'all last week where I did the cloud in a bottle where it had the white powder form. And when I let that sit, the white powder all settled out. It came out of solution and it made a little solid powder at the bottom of the liquid. What do you think an arrow up would be then? Liquid. Not liquid, but gas. gas. So this means it's gonna form a gas, that you're gonna get bubbles. An arrow over, this arrow over right here, what do you think it stands for? Powder. What? Powder. Still can't hear you. Is that what you said, liquid? No. no. Uh, it, the arrow over means yields or makes, but you might have said that, but I couldn't hear. I'm deaf. Yields. Okay, PT 
is, uh, so this year it means yields or makes, and you probably learned that one when you had physical science. Did you learn that, that the arrow means yields? Okay, the next one, PT, is platinum, and this would be a little, some chemical written on the arrow, and it's often platinum. Any guess what that one could be for? You might have learned about this in physical science, you might not have. I usually teach it when I teach physical science. It is a catalyst. Have you heard of a catalyst? Did you hear about in biology that in your body, enzymes are a catalyst? Somebody saying yes. A catalyst is something that you add to a reaction and it doesn't actually take place in the reaction, but it puts other chemicals together so they can react. It's sort of like a matchmaker. You know, a matchmaker could make get a, a couple together, but the matchmaker doesn't actually take place, take part in the marriage, do they? They just get the couple together. Now, we don't have matchmakers here. I actually knew somebody in college who had an arranged marriage, and so he, they would have had a matchmaker. Uh, he was from a different country. But anyway, so sometimes there is a chemical added that will make the reaction happen that doesn't really take place in the reaction, but it facilitates it. And we'll learn more about that. And it's called a catalyst. Catalyst. If the arrow goes two ways, we're talking about that arrow right there, it means that it's a reversible reaction. And we'll learn more about these things. But y'all are familiar with this because you all have cell phones. And the cell phone has a battery in it. And the battery takes chemicals and turns it into electricity. But then if you plug your phone in, it runs the electricity back through the battery backwards. And you can get the chemicals you started with back again. And your battery will work again, won't it? Right? All that makes sense to you? Yes, ma'am. It, there should be a copy for you with your name on it in the makeup work drawer if you weren't here. If not, there should be extra copies on top of on the stack. But you, if you weren't here, there should be a copy with your name on it. All right. Uh, does that make sense to you, a reversible reaction? We're going to do a whole unit on that later um, of called equilibrium, about how reactions can go back and forth. Okay, a triangle. I've taught you this. What is it? Change, right. Okay, so it means change, but if you see it on the arrow, it means a change in heat. So it, usually, it means you have to heat it up. Sometimes it'll just have a triangle, it means you have to heat it up. Sometimes it'll say the word heat. So it's the same thing. Heat means you is the same thing you heat it up. And sometimes they'll tell you what temperature to heat it up to, but sometimes they'll just say heat. Put, put it Like when we made those pennies, we heated them up in the fire. It didn't have a temperature. It just said, we just knew we had to heat the pennies up. Right? Okay. KPA. Anybody know what? I'll tell you. It stands for kilopascals. Anybody know what a kilopascal is? It sounds like you're doing something very violent to Pascal, but what is it? Anybody know what a kilopascal is? No, sometimes they're atmospheres, sometimes they're millimeters of mercury, sometimes they're inches of mercury. What is it? Pressure, yes. So pressure has lots of units. And when we get to the gas laws, there's a great song we'll sing, but there's also a bunch of units of pressure. The reason why is, is if you remember when I told you about the history of chemistry, some of the first things they started working with when they turned it from alchemy to real chemistry was gases. Remember Anton Lavoisier, the, um, he's one of the people who's called the father of chemistry. He discovered oxygen because they didn't know that it was in the air. But anyway, so one of the first things they did was working with gases, so therefore a lot of different units of pressure sort of all came about at once, and they're all still used. There's still tons of units of pressure. And then a little E, sometimes you have to, like Frankenstein, shock it to life. Sometimes you need electricity. And you saw that in our video 
Adam's ring of truth where he was shocking the water and making hydrogen and oxygen gas. Remember that in our video? Okay. All right. Now, I told you that it tells you all of this stuff. Well, it also tells you how much. Quantitative relationships. We're going to look a little bit at this, but the quantitative relationships, how much you use in this reaction, is really our next unit. The thing that I told you about called stoichiometry. But we're going to look at just sort of the, the most basic look at this, which is goes back to our law of conservation. And what's the law of conservation? You can't create or destroy matter, so what you put in is what you get out. So the things are just rearranged. So the thing that tells you how much is the numbers in front, the big numbers in front, and those are called coefficients. So the coefficients so that would be like that, tell you the relative numbers of formula units. So here I have this equation. And right now, y'all are probably, some of y'all are doing this reaction right here. This is sugar, and you had some breakfast. You might have had a Pop-Tart or some sugar cereal or a candy bar or something like that, right? Some of y'all have had some sugar today. I had some fruit oatmeal, so I've got this reaction going on myself because of the banana and the oatmeal. So here's the sugar. You add it to oxygen, so everybody take a breath. There's that oxygen, and it produces... Breathe out carbon dioxide and water. Feel your breath. It's moist. Feel that water there? You are doing this reaction right now. You are burning the sugar up, and you're also making energy. That's why you do the reaction. You're not trying to produce carbon dioxide from the plants and water to keep the air moist. You're doing it because you need energy, and so you ate breakfast. Okay, let me grab my thing. I want to make sure I do this right. Hold on one second. Should have been more organized here, but I didn't. It was five. Actually, I was too organized. I had this out on my desk and I took it out because of the digital day Friday. Here it is. All right. Make sure how I'm going to do it. Okay. So, one of the things we learned about, we're going to learn about, and we learned a little bit about a long time ago, is do you remember that we learned about moles? that it is a convenient amount to measure chemicals in. It's about, so we don't measure in teaspoons and cups. When I go to make a reaction, I don't get out measuring cups or anything like that. And instead, I base weighing things using the scale. I weigh my ingredients based on a concept called moles. So the moles, and that's what we're going to work a lot more with next time, um, is the coefficient in front. So this one has an understood what? One. Remember, if there's no number, it's an understood one, and we don't write ones. We like them to be understood because we want to be just as cool as math. The number from oxygen is six, so that would be six moles, six moles, six moles. So if you mix one mole of sugar and six moles of oxygen, you can get six moles of carbon dioxide and six moles of water. And all of this will make more sense when we do next unit. But data shows you do better if you're introduced to it slowly. Okay. It also tells you the number of, oh, we can also tell the number of molecules. How many molecules are in a mole? Do you remember that when we learned it? No. Much bigger. 6.022 times 10 to the 23rd. So I have one mole of this. So it would be, if I wanted the molecules, it would be 6.022 times 10 to the 23rd molecules. If I want, and whose number is that? Do you remember? He's Italian. He's fabulous. What's his name? Avogadro, right. I'm sure I'm pronouncing that very good Italian. Remember his picture? Avogadro's number. So if I wanted the number of molecules of oxygen, it would be six times Avogadro's number. 
If I wanted the number of molecules of carbon dioxide, it would be six times Avogadro's number. Hashtag was also number for you modern people. Six times Avogadro's number. If you want to know the number of molecules. Does that make sense? Okay so far? Okay. Now the mass. To get the mass, you have to look on the periodic table. And you look at those decimal numbers and you add them up. So if I wanted the mass of this sugar, I would look up the mass of carbon, multiply it times 6, plus the mass of hydrogen times 12, plus the mass of oxygen times 6, add it all up, and it's 180 for one, one of them. For oxygen, it's 16, and there's two of them, so that is 32. But... For oxygen, I have six of them, so it's six times 32. Carbon dioxide is 44, but it'd be six times 44 from the coefficient. And water is 18, but it'd be six times 18. And then what those equal on the bottom? 180, 192, uh, 264, and 108. Now, we're going to practice that more, and it'll make more sense, but I just wanted you to see that we can get these relative amounts from the balance coefficients, the balance equation, and the periodic table. So, we'll be using the periodic table on this. What is that one below next to molecules? 6.022 times 10 to the 23rd. And then this one is 6, which is Avogadro's number. And I didn't rewrite it over and over again. I just did 6 times Avogadro's number, 6 times AV's number, 6 times AV's number. And then how you get this mass, make a little note, is from the periodic table. So you can remember that. So this, this thing that right there, we're going to be doing a lot of that with the next test. But I'm introducing the concept now. So this is if you had one, um, let me make sure with that one. Okay. Yep, that's what it was. I sort of, I took something out of that. I kind of left that, but I took the chart out. Okay, I see what I, I see what I was I did. I, t I made this a chart and then I took it away and I just left it as a question. Okay, so we had one glucose here, two, six of water. Does that make sense? The number in front of the glucose is one. The number in front of the water is six. So what if you had two instead of glucose? How many waters would you have? What? You would have, let's double check how I was going to do this. Yes. So if you had two, you would have 12. And let me explain that to you. These relative amounts can be expressed in moles. And a ratio can be determined. So sometimes you look at, you don't want just one of something. You want more, so like you, it's like when you want to double a recipe. Say you're making brownies and you want to double the recipe. You don't just have to buy two boxes of brownies. You need twice as many eggs, too. You need twice as much water. So sometimes you look at these numbers in front, the coefficients, and they can tell you the relative amounts, and sometimes you write it as a ratio. Now... Do you remember in math class that ratios can be written in more than one way? So you can write them like this, one dot dot six, a one to six ratio. 
You can write them like this, 1 to 6 as a fraction, 1 in the numerator, 6 in the denominator, or sometimes you write words, 1, 2, 6. Does, that, does everybody remember that from math class? You've learned ratios in math, right? You learn, I teach this when I teach math, I teach this in sixth, well, seventh grade math. Did you learn that in your seventh grade math class? Ratios, you remember that? Okay, so sometimes we can see like that. So, um, when you do this, you want to express the ratios in the lowest whole numbers. So if it's a fraction, you have to reduce it. You put that in the lowest whole numbers. Also, sometimes you tell the amount of energy. The reason why you ate breakfast was so that you could get energy. So a lot of times why we do reactions is we want energy. Let's see if I can get this to a little scroll. Ooh, ooh, look, it's scrolling, it's scrolling, it's so exciting. All right, so energy is often expressed also with a reaction. So this is our burning sugar, and it makes this much energy. If you burn, if you, uh, that's how much per mole the in of energy you have. Um, let me see. Okay, if it's negative, it means it's given off. See how this heat has a negative symbol? When, when you burn this sugar, one of the things it's doing is it's keeping you body temperature. If you die, you get cold, don't you? Because you're not burning sugar anymore. That's kind of creepy. But it is the Halloween season, so we can talk about that. Um, so if it's positive, it takes in energy. If it's negative, it gives it off. Sometimes it's written in the reaction. If it's written in the reactants, it's endothermic. If it, the energy is written in the products, it's exothermic, and energy is given off. If you had 24 moles of water produced, how much energy would be formed? Okay, well, we look at our ratio. Our ratio is 1 to 6. So 1 is negative 2,870, but if we had 24 then what is the relationship between 6 and 24? How, what times 6 is 24? 4. So we would multiply that times 4. Do you see how we would use that ratio a little bit? And the answer is 11,480 kilojoules. So we can use those ratios to figure out the heat. And we're going to do a whole unit on heat, which is pretty fun because you get to burn stuff. That's one of the reasons why you like chemistry, right, is you get to burn stuff. So the heat, heat one's pretty fun. All right, now how can reactions be used? Why would putting reactions to work? Why do we want a reaction? Why are you going to make your cookie reaction? Because what do you want? You want cookies. So one of the things you would want is the products. Why do you want a reaction? Sometimes it has desirable products. Well, what about my rat match reaction? Did I want a burnt match? Was that what I was going for with that reaction? No. What did I want? I want the fire. I want the energy. So the other re reason why we do reactions is we want the energy change. It could be, it could be we want more energy. It could be we want less energy. We might want to cool something off, or we might want to heat it up. That's a triangle, a very messy triangle. Okay, now, why would you not want a reaction? Why would you want to stop a reaction? There's a lot of chemistry based on stopping reactions, too. So you don't want to kill people? So you don't want? harm people, and one or two things that can harm people. Can chemicals harm people? Yeah, yeah. Yes. So one of the things we would not want is the products. And what else would we not want? The change in energy. The change in energy. What if it's an explosion you, and you don't want the explosion? You would not want the change in energy. That can also harm people, can it? Let's try to roll it again. Feeling lucky. Let's see if I can roll. Yes. 
it's just my day. So also, you know, an explosion where you wouldn't want the, it, it would also be the energy change. The energy change is also why we would not want a reaction. So we might have to prevent some reactions. Clifford, put away your phone. No phones. We don't have time for that in here. We got too much to learn. Okay, so there are five types of reactions. So on this test, a lot of what you're going to be doing is balancing reactions and identifying the five types of reactions. But they're pretty easy if you pay attention right now. Okay, the first one is um, we're, uh, here, we the, here we're making water. If you combine hydrogen gas and oxygen gas, you can get liquid water. So chemicals, compounds are made in a synthesis reaction. So this is where two things are getting together to one, and our symbol for that is a little heart, because we're getting together as a couple. Isn't that great? So we're, things are put together into one thing, it's synthesis. So how we're gonna remember these is with romance. This works out really good when I teach it in the spring because we're hitting it around February, but we can have fall romance too. Okay, two getting together to one is synthesis. So everybody remember that one. So an example that you learned about last year in biology was polymerization. What are proteins made out of? Do you remember that from biology class? Proteins are made of Amino acids. And what's the opposite of an amino acid? A nice young base. Science jokes. They're lame, but we have to tell them. So proteins are made of amino acids. Um, you, you can buy these for in the vitamin store. You ever taken lysine? Sometimes if you've like got cold sores, you take lysine, so it'll go away. Another one you learned about was carbohydrates. Do you remember what they're made out of from biology class? Simple sugars. Is this familiar at all? Yeah. Um, last year, the kids got sent home. And didn't, didn't, I don't think they learned this. Okay, so if you've got getting together, romance, what do you inevitably also have to have? Breaking up, right? If, if people can get together, they can break up. So compounds are broken down in decomposition reactions. So here, our symbol for this one is a broken heart. My broken heart is sort of lame looking. But anyway, I'm sure you could draw a better broken heart. A broken heart. So here we have one chemical, and it breaks down into three. Now, that's a little, doesn't fit our romance, but things are broken down if one thing breaks down into more than one. Decomposition. So when you die, we're talking about death again, your body decomposes. You're one thing, and you're going to break down into dirt again. Am I depressing y'all? Talk about this. Sam, uh, hoodie on the head again. Hoodie on the head. Okay, uh, number three. Okay, now, sometimes it's not this simple in romance, is it? People get together breaking up. Sometimes there's a cause for the breakup, right? Mm -hmm. Right? And what is that? The affair. The cheating. So our next one is the affair. And this one is called single replacement. A single replacement. So here we had the happy couple, hydrochloric acid. And along came zinc. Zinc was good looking. Zinc had a lot going on. Caught the attention of the chlorine. And then bada bing, bada boom. Now suddenly zinc is with the chloride and poor little hydrogen has to go off broken hearted. Do you see? What happened? Single replacement. It is very sad. Now, how do you know? It, it's hard for us to tell if a chemical's good looking, right? If they, if they have what it takes to bust up the couple. But there is a thing called an activity series, and it tells how, if a chemical can cut in or not. 
It's called the activity series. And I have, I think I gave it to you maybe on that polyatomic iron sheet. If not, I'm going to give it to you. But you look and you can think of it like a rank, a strength ranking list. When Now, I know they used to have this when I taught in Cobb County. I don't know if y'all have this. But our wrestler team there would rank the wrestlers by who in each weight class by how good you were. They would wrestle and then they would figure out, okay, this one's the best, this one's second best, this one's third best, so that when they went to the meets, they knew who to match up to wrestle the person from the other team. Do they have that for the wrestlers here? Do y'all do a weekly strength rank thing? Anybody here on the wrestling team? Y'all know about that? I don't know. So anyway, it was sort of like that. It's a list of chemicals, and the one on top cannot be replaced by one underneath it. But if one is, uh, but if one is above the other one, it can replace it. So it's a strength chart, and we're going to do that. So um, where's my little thing here? It's like strength ray element. Okay. So the strongest element is on top. The weakest is on the bottom. Um, now, so y'all need this to look at. I might let you fill this out later on because I want you to look. Can gold replace copper and copper chloride? Can aluminum? I'm going to need to show that to you so you can answer that. But we're going to just leave it for blank for now because I want you to look at that and discover it yourself. Okay, I'm going to scroll up. Moving right along. Let's go to the hole. Click around. Okay. So this, this knowing whether or not a, a chemical can replace another one in single replacement can be used to prevent a reaction. Because remember, one of the reasons why we don't want a reaction is the products. So they use this with zinc is stronger than iron. Zinc is above iron. So they will use zinc to coat iron and galvanize things. If you ever had a galvanized bucket or galvanized nails, the zinc becomes an oxide and it makes a protective coating on the iron. So it won't rust. So iron is great, but it rusts and gets, you know, falls apart. But if you coat it with zinc first, it'll, it will um, protect it. Okay. So the next kind. Now sometimes affairs are, are have another step to them. Okay. So this is how it works out. There is uh, two happy couples, and two of them get together and have an affair. Then the other two go to Starbucks and talk about those no good, low down, lying, awful people. And then as they're sitting there talking about their exes with the other person who got cheated on, suddenly love blossoms and then they get together. Anybody ever know that happened? Uh, last semester, one of my students said that absolutely happened in my family. Her dad ran off with her stepmom, and then her mom got together with her stepdad, who was his, her, who was her stepmom's old husband. And she said it was exactly that. They got together to talk about how awful they were, and then they, now they're married. And she said she really likes her stepdad, so she was happy how it all worked out. She liked her stepdad. She, she, she definitely has a favorite couple of the two, and it's mom and the stepdad, the ones who got cheated on, not the cheaters, dad and the stepmom. So anyway, so the, this is called, this is the do -si do and it's the double replacement. The double replacement reaction. So let's want, look at it and see if we can see it in the chemical reaction. So silver is happy with the nitrate. Potassium is w happy with the sulfate. But then silver got with the sulfate and potassium got with the nitrate. Notice what's in the front stays in the front. 
What's in the back stays in the back. The cations are still cations and go first. Anions are still anions and go second. Does that make sense to you? Okay. This isn't hard, is it? Okay, so then the next one kind of reaction is combustion. And you've probably heard of combustion before, right? Now, you know how uh, you've sort of got the idea already that there are certain things that we argue about in the scientific community. That it's not all set in stone. There's things that, that is a little bit gray. And it's one of the reasons why as you get farther into math, the math teachers will argue about when a problem is done and what the final answer is. We all do the problem the same way. It's just when can you quit as you get further along. Well, this is sort of one of those things. Combustion reactions. This bottom one is definitely a combustion reaction. But combustion is, add, is burning. It's, and burning is adding oxygen. This is burning methane, the bottom one. So this is the reaction that happens in our lab when we light our Bunsen burners. We are doing that, and it is combustion. We're all agreed on that. But there are some scientists that say even this is combustion. This is sulfur being added to oxygen, making sulfur dioxide. Sometimes they will say no. They would say that that instead is a synthesis, two things becoming one. So just to let you know, I used to teach out one book, Holt Visualizing Matter, they called This Combustion. I've taught out of another book, that says, no, that synthesis, y'all don't have a book. So uh, for us, we will call that synthesis and that combustion. Okay, and this is the difference. If it's combustion, it's going to add oxygen and it's going to make more than one thing. If right now, if we were to burn methane, it makes carbon dioxide gas, it makes water and energy. So I just wanted to go ahead and clarify that in the beginning. Is this combustion or is that going to be synthesis? That's going to be synthesis. All right. And then our last thing. Um, sometimes combustion is incomplete. This is complete combustion. You add oxygen, you get carbon dioxide, water, and energy. And that is what happens when I light my Bunsen burner. But if you build a candle, if you burn a candle, you get smoke, don't you? If you have a fire in your fireplace at home, you get ash and other, other things. So one of the big things with incomplete combustion is it can produce carbon monoxide, which will kill you. Did we talk about carbon monoxide not killing yourself with it in this class, or was that physical science? It was physical science. Okay, so I always have to give my don't kill yourself talk. Okay, so we kill ourselves on accident this way in Georgia all the time. And the problem is, according to the weather, we only get snow once every two years. So we really don't know how to handle cold weather. It's just a thing. So when we get snow, then people will, the power goes out. And then people are cold and, they, and they're hungry because they can't cook. So then they look out on the back deck and they see their grill and they think two birds with one stone. I'll bring the grill in, we'll fire it up, it'll heat up the house and we can have some delicious steaks that are thawing out in the freezer. And they kill themselves because it is incomplete combustion. It gives off carbon monoxide, which will kill you. So don't ever have fire in your house that's not in the fireplace. Sometimes people get too many candles going. They try to make it look all romantic and light a hundred candles and they can kill themselves that way too because candles give are not complete combustion. Candles can smoke, can't they? And then the other way that it happens is your car is does combustion. You know, you've got a combustion engine, and it gives off carbon monoxide too. Um, a few years ago, there was a family that was going to go from here, it's always here, to Alabama, and they had a covered pickup truck. 
And the kids ask if they can ride in the back, that that'd be fun to ride in the back of the truck to Alabama. The parents were like, yeah, sure. So the kids were in the back of the pickup truck, got to Alabama, and they were all dead. The, the, the truck was leaking exhaust into that covered pickup, and it killed the kids. Also, how we'll do this, I told you we can't handle weather, and so we kill ourselves on accident, is it's cold. And you think, oh, I don't want to get in my cold car and have to drive to work. So I'll go down to the garage, start the car, let it start heating up. I'll go get my coffee, get my briefcase, come back down, hop in the car, go to work, and it'll be all warm. They get to the garage, the car's been running in the garage, with incomplete combustion, carbon monoxide is colorless, odorless, you cannot detect it. They go walking over to the car, take a breath, drop dead. So people kill themselves on accident because they don't know how to handle the cold and that they don't realize watch out for incomplete combustion. Occasionally, we also hear it on the news where people die of carbon monoxide with space heaters. Some space heaters can give off carbon monoxide. I'm not sure which ones because most of them are electric and that would not. It's got to be something that would have some sort of fuel to it. I think it might be the ones that have oil in them. Have y'all seen those? They're space heaters that heat up oil because otherwise, where's the, I don't understand where it's coming from, but you'll hear it on the news. Family of 10 all died from a space heater with uh, carbon monoxide poisoning. Usually, space heaters will kill you because you got them too close to the drapes, and you fall asleep and the drapes catch on fire and the house catches on fire. Any questions about that? This has been a very gruesome talk, hasn't it? Ways to die with chemistry. All right, well, we're going to stop it here, and we are going to look at balancing chemical equations. Like, share, subscribe.